バリエーターの責任と実習規制について引き続きテック共同創業者ダニエル・ハワー様よりお話をいただきますそれではご登壇いただきましょうご紹介しましたが少々今準備をしておりますこの後最後のトークテーマとなります急成長するバリデータークラスバリデーターの責任と実習規制をテーマに金付きテックの共同創業者ダニエル・ハワー様よりお話をいただく予定となっております今しばらくお待ちくださいではこの後の予定をご紹介しましょう展示ブースに関しましてはこの後18時まで展開しております引き続きお楽しみくださいまた本日は19時よりこちらの会場にて CGV 主催の Web3 さくらバンケットを開催いたしますさらに20時30分からは銀座レイズクラブにてうねみさ主催 Web3 ラグジュアリー東京というものが開催されますこちらどちらも無料で参加できますのでぜひご参加いただきたいと思います詳細ウェブページよりご確認くださいそれでは準備ができましたキンスリーテック共同創業者ダニエル・ハワー様ですよろしくお願いします拍手でお迎えくださいはい、皆さん、私はダニエル・ホイン。私は話しているのは、バリデータ・レスポンシビリティ・セルフ・レギュレーション。はい、ちょっと、クイック・イントロダクションを言っていました。私は、プロトコルのチームを持っていました。プロトコルのチームを持っていました。ステークフィッシュは、プロトコルのチームを持っていました。ステークフィッシュは、プロトコルのチームを持っていました。ステークフィッシュは、プロトコルのチームを持っていました。ステークフィッシュは、プロトコルのチームを持っていました。ステークフィッシュは、プロトコルのチームを持っていました。ステークフィッシュは、プロトコルのチームを持っていました。ステークフィッシュは、プロトコルのチームを持っていました。ステークフィッシュは、プロトコルのチームを持っていました。ステークフィッシュは、Um, so, I think、uh, we've, we've definitely seen the validator ecosystem come more center stage after the Ethereum merge、uh, from POW to POS. And we're beginning to see more of these types of conversations around governance, specifically for how infrastructure service providers, aka the validators, have a role. That's moving away from the core devs that manage the Ethereum code base to how the infrastructure folks、uh, move it forward.、Um, so, this, this presentation, I'll get into the, the, the index soon, but、um, this is one of my favorite quotes by Philip Monk from the Urbit ecosystem. It says, If you don't understand the system you're using, you don't control it. If no one understands the system, the system is in control. I think this is a play on one of the most, I think, Uh, misused mantras that I think the crypto and Web3 ecosystem have used time and time again, specifically with the retail ecosystem, not understanding the systems they're using.、Um, the mantra is, right, don't trust verify. But if you guys don't understand how to read code or understand how to use these blockchains, then how are you supposed to verify it for yourselves? So then that means the infrastructure providers and the core devs. Are meaningfully the ones that actually are controlling the chain and the direction of it, which defeats the point of the type of decentralization and the properties we wanted out of that decentralization to support this new financial, supposedly new financial system.、Um, right? Because if you don't, you can just have to trust us and we might be malicious. So, right, right, who's supposed to be the system?、Um, right, so, delegators are the ones. Of, Those of you who hold these tokens and stake them with validators to get the, the rewards for securing the system, as the validators like us, we're the infrastructure service providers that control the nodes. There's the network foundations, the, the core teams that have started these projects,、um, and the seven core teams. And maybe specifically for Ethereum's case, it's the seven or so client software teams. Um, and right,、uh, 
tyranny of the devs versus tyranny of the majority, right? Which we have with different proof of stake systems. Um, let's let's say like Ethereum versus like something like Cosmos. So I'll be going a little bit into some of the history, some issues we've been facing in the proof of stake system that I think are going to become more important as we get begin to have all this regulatory scrutiny for larger uh, larger blockchains, software regulation, and some of what I would think is the pass forward that we can that we can have. What I mean by pass forward is. Um, right. If we were to kind of look at the future of this technology and the systems that we're going to be moving on, there's basically three paths. Um, it's, it's kind of ironic that, let's say, the West and all the political parties in the West are quite anti-crypto now, right? And so their goal is to quash, squash crypto. That's one path. The other path is the infrastructure service providers like ourselves, the validators, those of us who belong or, or reside in the West, we don't want knocks on our door that say like, hey, you're gonna go to jail if you don't stop running this technology. And then the, hopefully the third um, brighter path is that we are able to self-regulate and show some of the responsibility that we have to work with some of these regulatory organizations. So yeah, we'll, we'll go quickly to validate responsibility. And so what are the responsibilities of a validator, both from let's say a technical perspective and perhaps of a governance perspective. So right, there's obviously the infrastructure management that's, let's say, the stronger, well-developed right arm that we have, right, for the folks that understand the DevOps importance. There's a governance both from a direct token governance that some chains have like Cosmos, and then the governance for client choice and then general overall direction of these chains like Ethereum. Um, and then, right, the purpose of our sole existence of these infrastructure providers being we have to be many in number for decentralization. Because decentralization, not just a meme, means that we have to uh, make sure that we're resilient and robust. Right? One goes down, the system doesn't go down. That also goes into layers, right? Validators and the data centers and the cloud providers that we have hosted. So let's unpack this. Um, I think that one, one concept that we can kind of use for responsibility of these validators and these infrastructure service providers can kind of mimic what we see in, uh, let's say, traditional corporate settings, right? We have like fiduci fiduciary responsibilities and governance responsibilities. Fiduciary meaning, right, we, for, the, for the validators that get the revenue from the stake that people are staking with them, we have a responsibility to make sure these nodes stay online, both the people who stake with us and the system itself. So, right, they should, in theory, be, be aligned. The reality is that they're not also always aligned. Um, some of the reasons, and I think a good example is the, the catastrophic failure of the Terra blockchain where validators did know what was going on from the infrastructure level both from the undisclosed pre-mine to the chain history changes to validators passing infrastructure proposals through that retail had no idea what was going on, right? They, they basically screwed over the ecosystem. And so they're not aligned, right? Because validators knew that if they reported things on this blockchain, they're shooting themselves in the foot because the rewards that they were getting was in the Terra blockchain itself. So sometimes, right, the communication is necessary and perhaps this communication had failed most, most of the time because we had obviously no centralized regulatory authority that told us what to do, right? We had more of a decentralized system with it's like bystander effect, right? And so the type of voting that could happen and governance that need to be communicated has happened. What was voted on and why you voted, right? So, um, yeah, I'll go into self -report. Oh, there we go, I think. Yeah. Second section is uh, self-regulation. I have a picture of Clint Eastwood here, I think. <laughs> so, um, I'll go keep going without my slides. Self-regulation, I think, is... Uh, an important um, 
aspect of what validators need. Um, an example of that is basically, right, we have no centralized regulatory authority that gives us um, commands on what to do, right? This is basically like a decentralized system that gives us an opportunity to decide what or what we don't want to do. Um, an example that I have here is uh, basically the Securities Exchange Commission, or if people are familiar with the U.S. regulatory system for financial institutions, it's FINRA. Right? FINRA is a self-regulatory organization that is not a government organization that has the ability to enforce levy fines, um, etc. And, and for example, if you want to be a financial analyst or, or, or more, um, you, get, you take like a Series 7 exam, etc. So, oh, thank you. So, that's it. So then, right, if we don't have any centralized regulatory authorities that get to decide the direction of these blockchains if things go wrong, then who's going to be the ones in charge, right? Like, is it the people? And so then what happens when things go wrong? Right, as I said, right, the whole concept of like this don't trust verify situation, um, people, what I mean by people is the vast majority of these token holders that are supposed to hold these tokens for the purpose of governing these blockchains, you know, I, no one does, like no one understands, right? So how, how are the bad actors supposed to help with this? Right, this is a really good example. I actually used to work at a law firm back in 2012, and if you remember the case with HSBC, my law firm was actually defending HSBC for their money laundering and terrorist financing. Um, I'd actually arranged crypto law firm, and that's how I got into crypto, starting the Bitcoin mine. But the example is there's a whole Netflix documentary on the HSBC fi fiasco. No one went to jail, right? There was a slap on the wrist. Right, one month's revenue fine. And so that type of regulation, even with centralized authorities, did not, did not work itself. FINRA didn't work, the SEC slapped them on the wrist, right? Um, and then this was like a, an example of, right, even centralized regulation sometimes has issues. Even with crypto, right, this is an example or a walk down memory lane. I don't know if any of you guys remember, there was a blockchain on Cosmos called Juno, um, Basically, self-sovereignty was violated. 99% of the entire blockchain's token holders voted to yank money out of this validator's wallet. It was actually a Japanese validator. Um, and then, you know, we screwed up. Basically, $36 million worth of Juno tokens was taken from a wallet without consent. Um, and then it was actually sent to a dead address instead of a... Uh, uh, community, con community controlled smart contract. Um, and so something as horrible as this, if that should happen in the, in the traditional world, there'd be lawsuits and fines and, and maybe licenses taken away. Um, and all 125 validators that were responsible for pushing the code to enable this code change to happen, um, n no one got in trouble. Like nothing went, nothing went on. It's like business went on as usual. And I highly doubt that anyone learned from their mistakes. Um, and so, right, this, this kind of represents this problem that we have. Centralized regulation not working, decentralized regulation not working, where the token holders were supposed to know what was supposed to be best for the system, didn't do the right thing. And so this is a quote that basically, I think, summarizes a lot of these issues that we have. Markets are like fire. In controlled environments, they can cook your food and heat your home but uncontrolled it can burn down your entire village. And that was basically a, an example of what had happened here, right? We had tyranny of the majority where the majority did not understand the responsibilities um, that they should have had and they didn't even execute them. So, right, and then that's basically the assumption that the entire decentralized community that we have assumes that they're rational, but the reality is that people actually don't give a, uh, don't care so much. Uh, so then, they don't care, right? So I think this is a really nice uh, quote. I won't read it, but basically it's um, this sort of paternalistic approach that centralized regulatory authorities have, more particularly in the West, I would say, um, where, where there's failure, then people come to rush in to fix it. Um, and that responsibility for validators because we're basically the last line of defense for these malicious actors, and then oftentimes, we are the ones that are the malicious actors, 
right? Where do the check and balances come from, right? And so some of the examples that we have to combat some of these issues is, right, activist shorting, right? I don't know if you guys remember um, the infamous attempt to short Chainlink um, by a fund and it failed, right? Another one is cancel culture, where a lot of the traditional crypto native Web3 community did not take a particularly great liking to Ripple or XRP, tried to cancel it, people left, but then we had this situation with, of ebbs and flows, right? The people who did care about the fraud that had happened in particular blockchain communities would leave, and then the people who were new to the ecosystem would come in, the people who, who had left, who could give you the information for, to the new people of the wrongdoings were not there anymore, and so the only ones that were left in these systems were the people who knew the wrongdoings, but chose to continue orchestrating misinformation so the new people that came into these systems had no idea, and then they would get duped again, and then you would have the cycle happen over and over again. Cancel culture is another good one uh, with BitCloud as well. Um, and so then we have this system where we did in these self-regulatory organizations with token holders and the people uh, like infrastructure service providers that manage these, right? We have to manage this, this fan or, or, or retail or delegator, retail or institutional delegator opportunities. This is a really good example. I don't know if you guys recognize who this is, but this is the, the director of Juventus, a popular football club where Luciano Maggi had actually threatened referees for years and um, extorted a lot of the, the soccer clubs um, and got away with it. Eventually, uh, what had happened, he was caught. All, all directors of Juventus had resigned and then Juventus had to get demoted um, in their rank. But the, the hilarious thing was the Juventus fans who um, who were benefiting, and then also the other fans that were not benefiting from Juventus cheating, you know, they still love Luciano Maggi, even though he had done very illegal things. And so this is an example of, right, if we had a traditional token governance system, or even infrastructure-led governance system, right, this sort of bad holder mentality is not going to do the right thing, right? Because if you're a bad holder of a particular chain that screwed up big time, and you have the responsibility or sole authority to right what's wrong, then you're probably not incentivized to expose some of the bad things, which is what also had happened in Terra. Um, and so that's what we would, that's basically called mob rule. And that's what had happened also on the Juno blockchain, where 99% of all state Juno tokens had voted in direct violation of some of the core principles of what blockchain stood for, aka self-sovereignty, right? Another good one is, right, GHash in 2014. For those who, if you remember, right, like, they had controlled over 51% of Bitcoin's hash rate, uh, this mining pool, and the only way that they were able to fix that problem was they had to voluntarily, the miners had to voluntarily step away, which is, which is no robust way of, of, of saying things. Um, so, okay, right, I, I ran out of time, apparently. So I'm gonna get to this um, really close the, the end, right? This communication with delegators that we have right now has failed, um, right? This, ex this, this, for example, is exposed by validators attempting to communicate with their delegators and stakers to do things, and then, right, they're just yelling into this, this maw and this storm, right, where no one's listening, right? So I think one, way, one takeaway that I think we can look forward to in the positive direction for self-regulation for the guidance of these blockchains is that we can establish more standardization um, and frameworks, aka, right, I'm not saying we create FINRA, but FINRA is a good example of how certain self-regulatory organizations that are consortiums of members um, can kind of control themselves that allow them to complement and exist side-by-side uh, -side existing sovereignties. Because whether we like it or not, Right, like the like literally working in crypto for certain tokens that um, exist to replace certain uh, monetary systems. It's an active act of rebellion, right? So you know, as the U.S. government can be happy for replacing the U.S. dollar, and if they know you're running nodes, and then they just have to come after all the nodes and the validators, you just have to knock on your door and put you in jail. Right? So the only way is to uh, to do that. So. 
There's examples of different political parties, activist validators. But I think what's important and what I think needs to happen for validators in the validator ecosystem that are essentially the ones that are controlling these blockchains in the direction of them because the retail is, literally has no other say except for voting with their feet is we need standardization, framework, self-regulation, incentive, incentivization mechanisms, and I think classification can help solve a lot of our hardware problems. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. ありがとうございました。